Well, good morning. Welcome to Redemption Life Bible Church. Uh, we are gathered here this morning virtually through the internet to hear God speak to us through his word, to respond to that word with repentance and faith and prayer and praise. And typically we gather as a church to have fellowship with God's people. Uh, if you're a guest here this morning, you're not a member of RLBC, we want to welcome you and we want to thank you for stopping in and we hope that the Lord will bless you uh, as he speaks to you through his word today. Uh, just a few announcements this morning. Number one, we will continue doing it this way. We'll keep recording our sermons and, and doing our small groups through Zoom until further notice, until the ban has been lifted. Uh, so keep your eye out for all of those things. Uh, second, also, uh, this Sunday is Palm Sunday, the Sunday in which Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a donkey. And so that means that this Friday is Good Friday and next Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. Uh, and so this year, um, I want to record a sermon, uh, a message for Good Friday. And so I'm working on that now, and it will be released on Friday around noon. So be watching for that. And then as well, the Lord's Day next Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, uh, there will be a sermon released at 1030. Uh, so be watching for those and be watching for announcements through email and our Facebook page. Uh, the last announcement is this. Uh, we have just set up a way for you to give online if you are so inclined. And so if you want to do that, you can reach out to me for the information um, or be watching your email, watching our Facebook page. And I will be making it public um, so that others can give a one-time gift or, or if they want to help support the church as well. So that's all the announcements. We pray that the Lord will bless you this morning as you sit and hear his word. Please hear this call to worship from Psalm 95. O oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his for he made it and his hands formed the dry land. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. As at Meribah, on the day of Massa in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. For 40 years, I loathed that generation and said, they are a people who go astray in their heart and they have not known my ways. Therefore, I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Well, at this time, would you please join me in a prayer of confession? Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much of the devices and desires of our hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done. And we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And there is no health in us. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us miserable offenders, Spare thou them, O God, which confess their faults. Restore thou them that are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. Now, I know this morning that you are gathered in your homes and you are watching on your TV or your phone or your computer, uh, but I would still ask of you, especially you, RLBC, that you would join me in confessing the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, 
was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into Hades. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic or Universal Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. If you have your Bibles this morning, and I hope you do, we will be in the Gospel of Mark as we continue our trek through the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 15. And we will focus this morning on verses 1 through 15. We will pick up on Good Friday in verse 16 and work through to verse 47. And then on Resurrection Sunday, we'll pick up in chapter 16, verse 1. So Mark chapter 15, beginning in verse 1. And as soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. And they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, You have said so. And the chief priests accused him of many things. And Pilate again asked him, Have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further answer, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the feast, he used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them, saying, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him up. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him! And Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him! So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, I pray, Lord, this morning as we sit in our homes and as we hear this message on our phones and over the the internet, on the computer, and even on the TV screen, I pray, Lord, that this message would have no less effect, but that in seeing what's really happening here, that our minds would be blown at your mercy and at your grace and sending Christ, and sending Christ, the righteous one, the holy one, the sinless one, to die in the place of sinners. Father, your word says that even while we were yet your enemies, Christ died for us. Lord, I pray that we would marvel, that our hearts would be led into worship this morning as we see and understand what Mark is trying to show us and teach us in this passage. In your holy word, inspired by the Holy Spirit, perfect, inerrant, infallible, we give you praise for your word. We pray that it would be at work in our hearts. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the things that I have deeply desired to show us as a church during this series is that Mark teaches us a wealth of theology by way of narrative. He teaches us deep theological truth, the doctrine of Christ, the doctrine of sin, and many others by way of story. For example, the narrative in which we see Jesus walking on the water in the midst of a storm it is a clear allusion, I think, 
to the Lord of the Exodus in the Old Testament. The Lord of the Exodus leading his people, his old covenant people, through the Red Sea. Footprints unseen. And what is this, Jesus walking on water in the Gospel of Mark, except for Mark showing us in regarding the doctrine of Christ that Jesus is Yahweh in the flesh. That he is the one true God, the Lord of the Exodus, here again walking on another sea. And we can list numerous examples, and we have seen many of these during our trek through Mark together. And so in light of this, this fact that Mark is teaching us important doctrine through story, through narrative, the question this morning is this, what is Mark now trying to teach us in this portion of Scripture, this portion of narrative? What does he want us to learn in regard to Christ in this passage? Or what theological truth or doctrine is he aiming to teach us here? And answering that question will be our goal this morning in our time together. And I would add that this is one of the most important truths. What we're going to see here is one of the most important truths that we can possibly know as Christians. It is a truth, a reality that is really at the core of the gospel that we believe and love. So now, for those of you who might just be joining us online, not having heard the rest of the series in Mark, which what I would encourage you to go look up and to listen to. Uh, let me give us a very short overview of Mark up to this point. Back in chapter 1, Jesus begins his ministry and he is presented as the Lord. The Lord who brings the gospel of salvation. And now up to this point, he's been doing ministry for around three years. And by the time we get to our text, um, he has been proclaiming the good news that he is king and that he as king has come bringing his kingdom, a kingdom of salvation, a salvation and life and freedom from sin, Satan and death that are found in him and his kingdom alone. And alongside of this word proclamation, this preaching with his reign as king and the offer of salvation within his kingdom as central, alongside of this, he has done many works or miracles as a testimony, as evidence proving that the words he proclaims are true. Proving that he really is the king, the son of man and son of God. The one who has brought the kingdom of God and the power found within the power of the age to come or the world to come. But this ministry of truth proclamation and miracle working has caused an uproar, especially among the Jewish leaders. Now you have to remember that Christ is a Jew. He has Jewish blood, Jewish heritage, and he has come within Israel as a teacher, as the one who claims to be the fulfillment of all of their scriptures' prophecies. And so now people are listening to Jesus because he has come and he speaks with the authority from heaven, unlike the scribes. And he speaks this way because he is the king of heaven and the son of God. But this causes the Jewish leaders to be jealous or envious, as made clear in our text in verse 10. But not only that, but Jesus as God in the flesh, the God-man, he has rebuked these Jewish leaders who were the teachers of the day. He has corrected their teaching. And this has made them angry because until he came on the scene, they were the highly respected, respected teachers and rabbis of Israel. But not anymore. They are now being rebuked and corrected by Jesus, who claims to be the Son of God, the King of Heaven. And now that they are being pressed and questioned and corrected in front of their people, 
they hate it and they despise Jesus. And so from the beginning, these Jewish leaders despising Jesus, instead of seeing their own sin and repenting and following him as king and savior and son of God, they have sought out ways to kill him. And finally, as we come to the end of Mark, it seems that they have been successful. They were able to get Judas, one of the 12 disciples, to betray Jesus. They were able to find false witnesses who were willing to testify falsely against Jesus. And then they came in the dead of night with Judas in the lead to arrest him and to drag him before the Sanhedrin not knowing that they were actually fulfilling the predetermined plan of God regarding the salvation of the world. And so this morning now, we come to a place near the very end of Mark's gospel where Jesus, the Son of God, has been arrested. He has already been on trial once, and now he will be taken to Pilate for another trial. And this trial, this moment in Mark's gospel teaches us much about his mission and his ministry. If you have your Bibles open, notice in verses 1 through 6 that we are given a context that is incredibly important. The stage is being set here for us for an incredible picture of truth, an incredible doctrine. Jesus is standing before the Jewish leadership, or the Sanhedrin, in verse 1, after having been arrested in the garden. But the Jews cannot actually crucify him. They don't have that power and authority under the Roman government. And so therefore, if they want Jesus put to death by way of crucifixion, they must take him to Pilate, the Roman governor, which is what they do in verse 2. And not only has Christ now been taken to Pilate, but he has been taken to Pilate, who has the authority to crucify him, to put him to death, during a very specific occasion. A very specific season. And what season is that? What occasion is that? Well, according to verse 6, it is the feast time. And we are told that during this feast time, this certain occasion, which is surely referring to the Passover feast and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, a feast which Jesus and his disciples just celebrated together in chapter 14, we are told that during this feast, during this time, Pilate would release for them one prisoner of their choosing. And this sets the tone for the rest of the passage and really for the incredible doctrinal truth that Mark is about to present to us. The rest of the story is about one man being taken prisoner and ultimately one man being released. One man being taken prisoner and put to death while the other is set free. And it is now in the midst of that context, the release of a prisoner and the keeping of a prisoner, that another character is introduced into the story. And who is this character now introduced according to verse 7? It says, Among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. A notice how Barabbas, this new character introduced into the story, notice how he is described. He is described as a man who was one of the rebels in prison, who has committed murder, apparently, during the insurrection or the rebellion. Probably a rebellion against the Roman government. And so the man presented to us in verse 7 is clearly a wicked man, a rebellious murderer who deserves prison, a man who has rebelled against authority, presumably the Roman government, an authority that is over and above him. 
And yet that's not all he's done. He has also murdered another human being in the process. And so if we step back, we essentially see in Barabbas a sinner who has sinned vertically and horizontally. A sinner who has rebelled against all authority over him. And this rebellion vertically has led to horizontal sin around him. And in this way, although Barabbas is a real person in real time, in real history, who really did stand next to Jesus here, he becomes, I think, an illustration for all sinners of all time. And what I mean is, is Barabbas here represents or stands in the place of all sinners because like Barabbas, all of mankind has rejected the authority that is over them. And I'm not talking about national authority, like the Roman government or the United States government. I'm talking about the authority of God Almighty. We have all rejected God, the ultimate vertical authority over us all. And this began in the garden in Genesis 1 through 3. Man from the beginning, when tempted, rebelled against God's word. That's vertical rebellion. Adam and Eve rejected God's word and his promise of life. But that rebellion against God, the vertical rebellion and sin, led to horizontal sin, which is seen and made crystal clear in Genesis 4 when Cain murders Abel. And so we learn from the beginning in the Bible that the vertical sin, namely rebellion against God, without fail leads to horizontal sin. Horizontal sins of all kinds, not only murder, but stealing and envy and adultery and more. All that the Bible lists. And now Barabbas with his vertical rebellion against the Roman government and ultimately against God Almighty, and his horizontal sin, namely rebellion and murder, it becomes in Mark, I think, an interesting paradigm that applies to all sinners in regard to our vertical and horizontal sin. Our vertical rebellion rebelling against God, and our horizontal sin, the effects of our rebellion, which is seen in our sin against other people. And so when we read this narrative, and when we ask the question, who is Barabbas, or who does he represent here in Mark, what can we learn from this person as he stands in contrast to Christ here? I think the answer is that in a very real sense, you are Barabbas. You are the sinner being represented here by Barabbas. You are the rebel who has rejected God from the beginning, rebelling and resisting from the womb, rejecting his word and his authority, doing whatever you want, whenever you want, regardless of what the authority, namely God Almighty, says. And this vertical rebellion has now led to countless horizontal sins which we commit every single day. Sins that not only offend God to the uttermost, but sins that hurt other people. And so really, when seeing Barabbas here in the text, we need to understand that we, apart from Christ, are Barabbas. We are treasonous rebels, worthy of being treated and penalized as the criminals that we really are in the sight of God. We, as rebel sinners like Barabbas, illustrated by Barabbas, are worthy of death and nothing more. And so Barabbas appears in verse 7, and he appears, in my opinion, 
as the picture par excellence of who sinners are in their vertical and horizontal sinful rebellion. Barabbas represents us. But now, on the far opposite side of the spectrum, standing alongside of Barabbas, in a sense, is Christ himself. And it is so clear in the text that Jesus is standing there on trial before Pilate for no good reason, humanly speaking, from a legal perspective. In fact, in verse 14, if you have your Bibles open still, Pilate himself says about Jesus, what evil has he done? implying that Pilate sees no reason to arrest or crucify this man standing before him. In other words, unlike Barabbas, Christ is not a criminal who should be imprisoned like the rest of the rebels. And this has been true from the beginning. Even when Jesus was standing before the Sanhedrin, they had to find false witnesses so that they could even try to start building a case against this sinless man. And only after he himself stated that he was the sovereign son of man from Daniel 7, only then could they get him on a charge of blasphemy because he was making himself equal with God. And that was all that they had. That was the only charge that they could possibly bring against him, not knowing, not believing, not understanding that what he said was actually true. So they had nothing on him, the Jews, the Sanhedrin. But then when they brought him to Pilate, that he might be crucified, they had to find another way to get Pilate against him, to get Pilate to crucify him because Pilate as a pagan leader wouldn't have really cared about Jesus' religious claims. He doesn't care about their little religious squabbles, their debates. And so what do the Jews do now that Jesus has been brought to Pilate? Well, the implication in the text is that when they brought Jesus to Pilate, instead of bringing up the blasphemy issue, which is what they really cared about, which Pilate wouldn't have cared about, what did they do? Well, instead of bringing that up, they bring up the fact that Jesus is being referred to by men. And really, in accordance with Daniel 7, Jesus is claiming this for himself, that he is the king of the Jews, that he too is a king. And that's referenced numerous times in the text. Verses 2, 9, 12, etc. And why would they do this? Why would they switch from blasphemy to Jesus proclaiming himself as king before Pilate? Well, they did this because Pilate as governor, hearing this, might have then seen Jesus as a threat to Rome's power or even Caesar's power and lordship. And then maybe then, if the Jews could get Pilate to see that Jesus was a king, even then, maybe Pilate would see Christ as a threat that needs to be neutralized. Lest other people go after another king, Jesus, usurping Rome's authority and power. But across from Pilate, while they're saying this, there stands Jesus, bound and silent in accordance with all the prophecies, especially Isaiah 53. And from Pilate's perspective here, he does not appear to be a threat. Jesus does not appear to be a threat here, bound and silent. If he is a king, he is not fighting like Pilate thinks he would or should as a king who has come to conquer Rome. And so the picture of Christ here, although he is king, and he indirectly affirms that in verse 2 when Pilate asks, the picture here is Christ standing next 
to Barabbas as sinner and rebel and scum. Christ as humble, quiet lamb on trial before Pilate, about to be taken to the slaughter for no sin and no crime of his own. No rebellion of his own. No treason or resistance of his own. In other words, he stands on the entirely opposite side of the spectrum in comparison to Barabbas. And we must see that if we are to understand what is happening in the text. We have one standing here who is wicked, a murderous rebel who represents all of mankind in rebellion against God, a man, Barabbas, who is worthy of death and hell forever, and next to him, the sinless pure and spotless, unblemished lamb of God, of whom it is said in the scriptures that he has been tempted in every respect as we are, yet without sin. Or 1 Peter 2.22, he committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. Here stands the one who is referred to as the holy and righteous one, Acts 3.22. And with all things considered, which one of these men standing before Pilate, Barabbas or Christ, which one should be released? Of course, Christ. The sinless one who has not rebelled and murdered like the sinner Barabbas. But which man is released? What happens next should utterly shock us. There are only two options. Barabbas the criminal or Christ the sinless king. Now either Barabbas will re remain imprisoned and pay the price that criminals deserve which will be right and just and in accordance with the word of God. Criminals paying for their own sins and crimes or Christ. Christ will be kept and treated as a criminal, paying the price that criminals deserve, although he is sinless and undeserving, which would appear to be horribly unjust. But what happens in the text? Barabbas, the murderous criminal, is released. Barabbas goes free. Verse 11 the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. And contrary to this freedom for Barabbas, verse 15 says about Christ, so Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. So Barabbas the criminal will go free and Christ the king will be crucified. And to us, this should be inconceivable. Like seeing a rapist go free while the victim is imprisoned. What a horrific breach of truth and justice. But what is going on here theologically? Christ is going to stand in the place of the criminal while the criminal goes free at the expense of Christ. And that, friends, is the gospel of Jesus Christ as prophesied in the ancient scriptures. That is the doctrine of penal substitutionary atonement. That is what Mark is teaching us in the story, I think. He is teaching us what is at the core of the gospel by way of story. But what exactly is penal substitutionary atonement? Commonly referred to as PSA by theologians. It is this. And see if it's in the text. You test it. Jesus Christ perfect Lamb of God, without blemish, sinless, holy, and righteous, standing in the place of sinners 
That's the substitutionary part. And he stands there, he goes there, he is there, enduring the penalty that we deserve. The penalty. Penal substitute. Penal substitutionary for what? In order that we might be reconciled to God by faith alone. Atonement. Or to say it another way, Jesus Christ came to die as a criminal, yet not a criminal, in the place of those who are criminals in the highest degree, meaning sinners who have rejected the one true God, sinners and criminals who have rebelled against and sinned against the one true King, God Almighty, Yahweh himself. Jesus came to die in the place of these criminals and rebels, enduring the cup of God's wrath, which we have deserved. That's substitute. That's the penalty. So that by faith alone, by repenting or turning from our sins, our specific sins, and trusting in Christ's work alone, his life death, and resurrection, we can come back into personal covenant relationship with the Creator God who gives us salvation and everlasting life in His presence. Do you see that in this text? Christ in the place of Barabbas, that Barabbas might go free. Or as Paul has put it in 2 Corinthians 5.21, for he, that is God, made him, Christ, who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. In other words, in the gospel, of which this is an illustration or a picture, I am arguing. There is a transaction that occurs, and we see that in the text. Barabbas is released, meaning he is being treated as Christ should be treated here the spotless, sinless lamb. While Christ is being treated as Barabbas, as if he is guilty and worthy of punishment and death. And that is what Paul is getting at in his summary in 2 Corinthians 5. The sinner goes free while the sinless suffers as a substitute. In the gospel of Christ, of which this is a picture, we as sinners are released and received or welcomed into freedom, into the presence of God, into fellowship and covenant relationship with God as if, as if we are truly sinless and righteous while Christ stands in our place as sinner deserving death. So this story I'm trying to show us, is simply a picture of the substitutionary work of Christ, which is at the core of the gospel, the good news of salvation. And how does this occur? Or how can this occur? Because this was the mission and ministry of Christ. That's how. He came to stand in our place in the place of the sinful and unrighteous becoming sin and enduring all that we deserve in order that we might stand in his place, his righteousness, and in true forgiveness before his Father, God Almighty. Christ as substitute, Christ paying for our sins, Christ enduring the wrath that we deserve, Christ's righteousness imputed or given to us as a gift, covering us as a spotless white garment, all by faith, that is what we see here. Christ in the place of the sinner Barabbas. Christ as substitute who takes the punishment, who takes the judgment, who takes the wrath, while Barabbas, who deserves it, goes free. Christ in our place. The place of all who believe. All who repent and believe in order that we might be accounted as righteous and forgiven, free from sin and death, inheriting eternal life. And about this glorious truth, this doctrine, 
substitutionary atonement or Christ in our place, Christ dying in the place of sinners. About this, C.H. Spurgeon said this, what the sun is to the heavens, that the doctrine of substitutionary satisfaction is to theology. Atonement is the brain and spinal cord of Christianity. Take away the cleansing blood and what is left to the guilty. Deny the substitutionary work of Jesus and you have denied all that is precious in the New Testament. And so as we come to a close, I hope you see how relevant this text is for you and me. You are Barabbas. I am Barabbas. And you can pay for your own sins, which is what you deserve. Suffering in hell forever because of your treason and your rebellion and your vile sin against God and man. And don't you dare try to argue your way out of this. Because no matter what you say, no matter what you do, you know this is true. You know you're a sinner. You know you have rebelled against God. You know you have sinned against him and you have sinned against those around you. And so you can pay for your own sins in hell forever. Or you can recognize that this is true, that you have rebelled against God, that you do deserve the wrath of God like Barabbas, and you can turn to Christ in repentance and faith. And when you turn to him, You can throw yourself upon him and believe in him. And when you do, your sins will be forgiven and you will be seen as righteous before God Almighty because he, Christ, will have stood in your place bearing the penalty that you deserve while you stand in his, inheriting eternal life with God Almighty. And I can think of no better way to end this morning than to read to you part of a famous hymn that captures this truth beautifully. Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came, ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Bearing shame and scoffing rude, in my place condemned he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Guilty, vile, and helpless we, spotless Lamb of God was he. Full atonement can it be. Hallelujah, what a Savior. May this be true of us. May we turn from our sin and trust in Christ as the one who stood condemned in the place of all who believe, but even more, who was raised and ascended to reign forevermore. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Would you please pray with me? Our Father in heaven, we give you praise, we give you thanks, and we stand in awe this morning as we ponder what you have done in your Son for us sinners. Lord, we give you praise that although we are worthy of death, worthy of hell, worthy of eternal punishment, We give you praise that you sent your Son, that whoever believes will not perish. We give you praise that you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, into the flesh, that he might live for our righteousness, obeying you in every way that we have not. That he might die for our sins, bearing the punishment and the wrath that we deserve. And yet he did not stay dead. But he was buried and he was raised triumphantly in glory for our justification as the sinless, spotless lamb that he is. And now he reigns king of kings and Lord of lords. And we give you praise, Jesus. We give you praise and we give you thanks that you left the glories of heaven. That you took on flesh to do all that we see in your word. And I pray now, Holy Spirit, that you would come that you would come now and open eyes and ears and hearts, that you would regenerate even now as the church is scattered in their homes, that you would save by your power 
that you would bring many sons to glory. I pray, Lord, that we would see how glorious and marvelous this text is. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. And now to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. And all of God's people said, Amen. Grace be with you.